Hey, this is Writer's Row. I'm DC Righthammer, and I'm joined by two very special guests tonight. I will let them introduce themselves. Hey, this is C.D. Tavner, author of First of Their Kind and Their Greatest Game, and also a, a line and copy editor. editor um, and I collaborate both with my under my own name as an editor, but also with uh, Meg, who's next to me, with Overhaul My Novel. Hi, I'm Meg Trust, Editor-in-Chief at Overhaul My Novel and author of Write That Book You Keep Talking About. And if you like the content I've been putting out on Writer's Row, make sure to subscribe. Click that button down below. Give this video a thumbs up. And actually, you're going to want to click that notification bell as well because this episode is part one and technically a three-part series. It's about editing, and we're going to actually do some real-time editing on this episode as part of this series. Um, we're going to follow up with another editing uh, video as well, and that's all going to culminate a week later in a live stream where you can, again, you're actually going to watch truly live editing, and you'll have a chance to ask questions and comment live on YouTube. So... Uh, make sure to hit that notification bell to to do that. So uh, with that said, I'm going to hand it over to CD to tell us um, what kind of editing we're doing tonight, and then we can dig right in. Thanks, DC. So tonight we're going to be focusing on the line and copy editing uh, that I uh, specialize in. So line and copy editing are slightly different from one another, but often happen together. So line editing is very much focused on uh, the the really honing in on the prose of the writing, the style of the writing, and um, making sure that all the grammar lines up and that everything flows well. Um, and copy editing will include that often, but also copy editing is just making sure that everything's consistent, that your words um, don't contradict one another. So like in one scene, don't call a character Bob, and then in the next scene, call them David without any explanation for why their name has changed. They've got to go to court to do that. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so we're going to be doing a line edit of the ch first chapter of a story called uh, The Light in Between by Serena Dolan. So, Serena, if you are listening, we are editing your story. So and, while he, and while Chris brings that up, I am going to mention that you're going to want to pay attention during all of these uh, streams, uh, these videos on YouTube. Uh, you're going to want to make sure to pay attention. We're going to be giving clues uh, away to basically a secret. If you figure out what that secret is uh, at any point, make sure to message that to myself, CD, or Meg, um, and tell us what the secret is. And if you're correct, you can win a full manuscript critique. Uh, so keep an eye out for potential clues as to what the secret is throughout this series. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, if you don't... If, if in the three videos, if you submitted a, uh, a sample to us and you're not one of the ones that is sample edited, don't worry. You'll still get some feedback from us. We just didn't end up choosing you to be done on uh, through a, a video. Uh, and I believe also, uh, not only if you give away your clue, if you get the clue right, you'll be entered in to be one of the people to potentially get a free manuscript critique. But the person whose edit we do on the live stream uh, that person will be offering a free manuscript critique as well. Uh, Meg, do you want to talk a little bit about a manuscript critique real quick, what that is and what we'll be doing? Yes, absolutely. So um, oftentimes, as you should as a writer, once you've completed your first draft or second draft, um, you will send your manuscript to a developmental editor or to a beta reader. Um, a critique is a little bit in between each of those. It's not as in-depth as a developmental edit, but it's not quite as surface as a beta read. And it is, of course, performed by myself and C.D. Tavener. So we will be collaborating on this effort and making sure that uh, we catch all the all of the everything, all the plot holes, and make <laughs> sure your character development is spot on, all that fun stuff. Yeah, so you'll be getting two people's eyes on it if you win that manuscript critique. So... With all those little logistical details out of the way, let's actually dive into the page that everyone's been staring at for like three minutes now. So, can you zoom in a little bit on that, Chris? It's yes, hard to see I the letters. Can. And while you're at it, you can actually take the Skype preview of our faces. Oh, you can just yes. pull that. Yep. Pull that <laughs> now I can't see you all. <laughs> you don't have to see us. We'll just be scowling at you the whole time. Yeah, whatever. 
All right. All right. We're good to go. That good? That good? Good enough zoomed in for you? Looks good to me. All right. Perfect. So I'm going to be doing a little bit of a read along for this as I get to each edit. And then some of the edits will go straight through if they're pretty self explanatory. Others will take a moment and discuss. So genetics is inevitable, kind of like fate. Genetics makes us look a certain way. Fate takes us down a certain road. So within these first few sentences, I'm already noticing that this story is, at least for this first part, being told in some form of present tense. Uh, and as we see in a few lines, it's at, actually at the end of the second line, first, pe first person present tense, which um, is always important to notice right away as an editor, because then you know how you should be framing your edits for verbs, because you've got to know how to edit your verbs properly and you'll notice that conjugation is very important um and you'll notice that it's actually pretty important within the third line in the first uh second edit that we get to but let's continue it's hard to fight the effect and i have deleted here the s effects both have on your life however so, yeah uh, let's talk about that yes yeah, so let's talk about this is actually a, this would be a suggestion but um not necessarily an edit that the author would need to make so chris does an author have to accept suggested changes when we're doing an edit? No. The author is the final arbiter of everything in their manuscript. An editor's role is to really just give a very, very, very in-depth look at a manuscript to make sure an author is confident in every word they're putting on the page. So, um, but the important thing is, is that if an author rejects a change suggested by an editor, that the author has a reason for rejecting that change. But an editor's job, especially for line editing when it comes to style, is to give alternatives to make sure that the author is confident in the words they put on the page. And so in this case, we have effects being plural. So Meg, do you want to break down why I might have suggested singular here? Yes. Um, when we talk about it's hard to fight the effect both have on your life. Um, there's a dichotomy here between fate and genetics, and there's a there's an implication of singularity in the following line. So you can say genetics and fate both have effects on our life, um, but it's hard to fight the effect both have. Um, the implication in this sentence is that it is that it's singular. They, that they're both having a similar effect, and that that effect being um, inevitability. So it really depends. This is very, very much author's choice: effect versus effects. Um, I would go with effect because singularity is highly implied in that sentence, and because it follows your theme as well. Yeah, absolutely. But that is this is one of those moments where. The author may have a reason they want to pluralize that. So yep. let's continue. Both have on your life. I mean, you can try, I suppose, but you'll, and I've changed you'd to you'll, talking about the present tense earlier, probably lose. That's what my grandma said. And so now we're really focusing on this first paragraph, but uh, this is an important thing to bring up. You may notice that I, I have not deleted use of your, you, you. Uh, the, it's, it's the second person is used three times here. And... Often, editors like to try and get rid of you a lot because, Meg. <laughs> because it breaks the fourth wall. Yeah. If you want to break the fourth wall, go for it. But in fiction, oftentimes what you want is to insert your reader into the story and keep them there. And referring to them in the second person will yank them out. Absolutely. And, but in this case... This is this line, I mean, you can try, I suppose, but you'll probably lose, is essentially a quote from the character's grandma. And so second person, totally fine. It's words coming from the grandma. All right, let's continue. That's what my grandma said. Where is she? I need her. My hands burn and tingle. Love that line, getting um, the, the physical sensation of the character right, right in there in the reader's mind. And then we have... Originally, it feels like a swarm of ants are building, uh, are marching tunnels in my, 
inside my veins or the biting of snow. So we've got a double analogy here and I would recommend into leaning into one analogy rather than two because if you have two analogies in one sentence, it kind of like waters down either of them. And so instead you can say, it's like a swarm of ants are building tunnels inside my veins, period, stop. Can you talk my, about word, word economy for a minute too? Yes, so you'll notice that um, I've cut down the words, uh, well, it's really only like one word here, but the use of one analogy instead of two is a good example of word economy where you can make the point stronger by leaning into the one analogy uh, and by cutting words a little bit and while still making the same point and potentially stronger. And also when Meg brings up the idea of word economy, she's talking about the idea that you, when you're telling a story, if you can say the same thing in fewer words, you should probably say it in fewer words because your readers are going to never know what that other version that was longer was like. And all you've done is move the story along a little bit more quickly. There are going to be reasons why you might want to spend a little more time on a thought, maybe for pace or whatever, but you never want to just have extra words in there for the sake of extra words. And on yeah. that note, I would strike the R between ants and building. Yes. I think that is a totally viable suggestion as well. And you could just say, it's it's like a swarm of ants builds tunnels, ants building tunnels inside my veins. Yeah, you wouldn't change building to builds. It would just be a swarm of ants building tunnels inside my veins. The other so, thing I would say on that line, there's actually two things I might say on that line, is that you could actually get rid of tunnels and then our building, and you could just say ants marching inside my veins, which is very more or tunneling. Like, yeah, or tunneling, or tunneling. right. Um, yeah. The other thing is, and I don't know this, I'm just asking the question, do ants roam in swarms or are they armies of ants? I can't remember. It's just something to th keep in mind if people are reading it. They might <laughs> get pulled Depends on up the ant it. species. Depends on the ant species. Um, don't, do don't look up army ants. Got but it. also, like, the so this discourse that we're having right now, you can do this endlessly with literally any sentence in your entire that. book. Yes. And it's very important not to do it all the time. Yeah. We're, sort of, uh, we're exaggerating it because this is an episode dedicated specifically to line yeah. editing. So. Yes. Absolutely. My skin radiates the kind of heat that's both hot and cold. Everything is shaking. You could say everything shakes. Um, and I don't know if it's my body or the world. In front of me is a compound of buildings. A large house on the left. Two small cottages on the right a path through a desert garden in between. So something I want to note here, you'll notice that we just had three sentence fragments in a row. I'm not editing that out because sentence fragments when used uh, sparingly, sparingly and yes, yeah, sparingly, but with like good intention uh, are really effective for good writing style. And I think this is great because you have in front of me as a compound of buildings and then she's listing the buildings and then a little bit of more description of the compound itself. Um, and, uh, you could also, I know, uh, Meg would, is probably going to note this, but you could also put a colon after buildings. And why is that? Because you're beginning a list. Um, you can do, you can put a colon there or, well, you could put a colon there. And I guess I should say, um, this is accepted, even though it's not a style that I really like, you can use, um, semicolons to separate list items. Yeah. Um, or you could use commas and then of course have an oxford comma and an and before the last list item yes yeah so there's a few op options there but i actually really like the use of the sentence fragments here i like uh, fragments personally too so. yeah i made it home i've been walking for an hour at least that's how long it usually takes to walk from school i can't i don't remember getting here so i've made a slight style edit here so originally she just had I must have. That's how long it usually takes me to walk from school. I don't remember. I can't remember getting here. So I've added at least comma. That's how long it usually takes to walk from school because this I must have is a little bit unnecessary and uh, is kind of arguing a little bit too much. It's and also, like you can just get to the point. It's kind of over explaining in a way. Yeah. Um, you, if you can get your reader to draw conclusions instead of drawing the conclusion for them, 
that's the way to go. Yeah. And saying yeah. that's how long it usually takes to walk from school. So your readers, your reader is thinking, well, it must you must have been walking that long then if you're yeah. home now. Um, so and instead of next... stating the conclusion, you let them do it. Yes, and then this next sentence is, I can't remember getting here. And then it's unstated, but now the reader is like, oh, why can't they remember getting here? What's mm -hmm. the stress that's going on? And that builds on the my hands burn and tangle that we saw previously. So, ya will most likely be in the herb garden. I've switched will to would. Would as a verb, especially when you're talking in the present tense, usually isn't good. Um, it's hypothetical. Just, yeah, exactly. Ya and will most likely, likely is also hypothetical, so you don't need both. Exactly. Yeah, and also ya, um, it's italicized. It's a, italicized here doesn't necessarily need to be used, but I, I think it's maybe just how the, the character is thinking about uh, their grandmother. And it's interesting because you, you're primed to know that she's looking for her grandma. And so usually it wouldn't be that natural to think that this would be her grandma's name, but like, I actually think it works that it just flows right in. You don't need to prime the reader here that this is the grandma. It's, it's pretty obvious that this is the grandma's name. I agree. Y'all will most likely, and that also might be a language term for grandma in another language. I'm not actually sure. That's something I would probably ask the author. Y'all will most likely be in the herb garden. I stagger forward trying to keep one foot steady in front of the other. I don't have my backpack. I must have left it at school. I don't know how I wasn't stopped. The guard wasn't on duty. I didn't see him. Or, and now we have, or comma, maybe comma, he just didn't see me. So there's a few parenthetical commas. Parenthetical commas, very important here. Uh, and you also notice that this paragraph, I didn't make any changes at all, even though we had a bunch of really short sentences, but they're all really punchy and I, all re I really like them a lot because it's really getting you, the, the use of the sentence structure here kind of helps you feel what the character is feeling. You're seeing- Our um, thoughts are very broken up. Yes. And confusing. Back and forth. And that's really good style. Like these are great sentences. I wouldn't change a thing. The sprinkler is on in the garden, comma, Oh, that comma's already there. Garden, misting the hot, dry air. Originally, it said sending mist into the hot, dry air. When possible, use the stronger verb uh, because it just is, it's it's punchier. Word misting economy. the hot, dry air. Yeah, it's another example of word economy. And uh, uh, misting the hot, dry air as, a pos as opposed to sending mist into the hot, dry air kind of gets even closer to that like physical feeling that people know if they've been in a hot, dry place and then all of a sudden they're hit by some mist. Uh, it's a great feeling. I love it. A Most small patios in Arizona have misters on them. Just yeah. a small FYI, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're from Arizona originally, right? My parents live there now. Ah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> a small rainbow arches over it. The plants look bright, comma, green, comma, and happy. And we have a example of an Oxford comma here because we have a list and Oxford commas are very important. Meg, why are Oxford commas very important? We need clarity. Um, so if you, if you omit the Oxford comma in that sentence, you get the plants look bright. And then green and happy would be a description of bright instead of bright, green, and happy being a description of the plant. Yes. So you're blending if you if you leave out the Oxford comma, you're blending the last two two line items, and it, that's never good. We have legal proof now that that's that that's uh, it's better just to be clear. It's yeah. always better to have the Oxford comma. It never creates confusion. It always only creates clarity. Meg's referencing that there's actually a there's a court case where a judge actually references the use of Oxford commas and. Uh, Meg and I are very, very zealous about Oxford commas. If anybody <laughs> ever tells you that you don't need Oxford commas, they're wrong. They're in wrong. The sense that there are going to be instances where you don't technically need an Oxford comma, but the only you only ever benefit by including an Oxford comma because it all it does is add clarity. So you should always add it. That's our opinion. We're very, very ardent about that opinion. <laughs> Take away anything that's important from this episode. It's the Oxford comma. Absolutely. 100%. Ya usually spends hours tending and talking to them as if they're precious pets. For now, she's not here, but she can't be far. I'm suddenly exhausted. I open the door to her cottage. 
We never lock our doors, not if someone is home. And so there was a period with a capital N, uh, so just lock our doors, period, not if someone is home. And I've actually added an M dash here to connect these two That's sentences. That's favorite punctuation. That's At least this partially year. true. We never lock our doors, M dash, not if someone is home. The reason why I've added this M dash here, and you do have to be careful because M dashes are super versatile, but if you overuse them, your readers will notice. Um, we can maybe a, a bonus <laughs> outtake about what, what Meg's referencing regarding M dashes for me. But we never lock our doors, not if someone is home is really describing we never lock our doors. And so adding an M dash here kind of keeps those connected in a little bit more of a clear way. This is another instance where it also um, it gives you some variation in sentence length as well, because we have yes. I'm suddenly exhausted. I open the door to the cottage. We never lock our doors. Not if someone is home. If you do the same type of sentence over and over, it gets exhausting. So adding that variation with the M dash um, gives a gives it a little bit of a melody instead of just having the same thing over and over. Which this is important because like up above we were saying that those short choppy sentences were good, but you don't want to overdo any sort of effect because then you lose the effect of doing that. So like this mm -hmm. paragraph is good, but if you do it again and again and again, then it kind of like just, as Meg said, is exhausting. So not if someone is home, light streams in through the white plantation shutters. I love this um, description here. The use of the word plantation shutters is very specific and immediately evokes an image in my mind, making the yellow walls glow like the surface of a star. Also great description. Yeah, I yell for her. Silence. Also great one word paragraph. My legs decide to give up then. I fall onto the couch, comma, the plastic cover making the sound of a ripping band-aid. So you'll notice I've combined these two sentences here because the plastic cover making the sound of a ripping band-aid is really a thought that's describing how she falls onto the couch. And so connecting those two sentences emphasizes that description. And I've also rearranged the words a little bit so that instead of saying the cover makes the sound of a band-aid ripping, Put the adjective in front of the noun. That, that is a verb. Hmm? That is a verb. Well, in this instance of a ripping Band-Aid, ripping is describing Band-Aid. It's an adjective it's, in this instance. It's still an action. Of ripping the Band-Aid. <laughs> Uh-oh. Well, okay, so actually, here's a, this, is a, this is a fun... So, in this instance, it's a verb... I would argue in this instance it's an adjective. If you put it, I guess it depends on how you read it. I was thinking of, like the action, like of ripping a like ripping a bandaid off, like of we'll a ripping bandaid. Like we'll come back like that, to this. the sound comes from the we'll action. I guess it could. I guess it could be a, a descriptor. It, I in didn't this think of it that it way. Is. It's after an article. It can't be a verb in the, in this sentence. It can't be a verb. Right. The verb is making. You can have more than one verb in a sentence. Yes, but in this instance, okay, <laughs> we're, we, are, we are going way off base. Uh, anyway, this is one um, of the, this is one of those moments where like you do want to have adjectives before your noun, typically speaking, yes. as well. Yes, and just because that's the way English sounds. Yes, and this is not really a rule for it. It's just one of those things. This little grammar debate that we had is actually a very good example of how like the very, very particular names for grammar rules aren't, aren't yes, but also aren't that important in the end. Because <laughs> if you understand what the sentence is saying and it's clear, like knowing which word is the verb or the adjective isn't entirely important for authors to know. You just got to know. You got to know the rules. You don't have to necessarily know the names of the rules. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, the plastic cover making the sound of ripping band-aid. So this brings us to an important note. You'll notice that Microsoft Word has this uh, as incorrect. And the reason why is because band-aid is actually a proper noun is the name of a brand. Now, this is a complicated suggestion to deal with because there's two things going on here. One, most people, depending on the region of the world that they live in, now kind of think of bandages as band-aids because band-aid is yeah. such a ubiquitous brand. 
So if a character is thinking of a bandage as a band-aid, then it might actually make sense to leave this lowercase because they're not actually thinking of the brand band-aid. Now, if they are actually literally thinking of the brand band-aid, then you would want to make sure this is capitalized. But a finer research point, if they live in a part of the world or if you're in a fantasy novel where band-aids don't exist, you should not use this word because it's a brand. All right. I'm still shaking. Instead of the shaking is still there, it puts it into the active voice of the character. The strange heat remains inside my skin. Same sort of edit. I lean my head back and close my eyes. Behind the darkness, we actually have a double space here that I missed. I see Warren Cooper's face. And we've got a new character introduced. Who is Warren Cooper? Very interesting. It distorts in pain, fear, comma. We've got another Oxford comma here. You'll notice that I have it pulled out as a comment. It distorts in pain, fear, and surprise. Good use of the M dash here. A comical looking combination. Uh, and you'll notice I've taken the descriptor that comes after combination that made him look comical and just turned it into an adjective. Um, something that Meg knows very well is that my least favorite word in the English language is that. You no, can almost. I know what your least favorite word is. It's not that. What? It's got. Oh, okay. Got and that. Even uh, though it's got its place. They both have their place. <laughs> Most words have their place, but that is actually a word that is often overused. Um, you'll notice that it's used I'm again in uh, the next sentence as well. Um, that is one of those filler words that usually can be edited out. And often when that is like added as like a descriptor sentence, usually that's a signal that you've got an adjective really that's hiding, as mm -hmm. we have here, a comical looking combination. I would have laughed, comma, had I not been the source of distress. I try to piece together what happened. And then we had moments are all I remember from it. And I have switched this to I only remember moments like clipped clips snipped from a movie reel. And so I also have a comment pulled off here. Excess prepositions. I also um, I really like just on a stylistic note. I like that analogy. Yes, like clips snipped from a new movie reel. Absolutely. But this is another example of word economy. It's mm -hmm. it's so so minor, but like there are so many prepositional phrases that people put together where you've got two prepositions next to each other where you almost always only need one or an entirely different preposition that can substitute for the two that you've combined. Mm -hmm. We were so in we world four about from and of and how you usually need only one. Yes, or off of. People will say off, off of, of yeah. and get rid of one of those two almost always. Yep. We were in world history. There was a test. My hands had been tingling since first period pre-calculus, comma, and the sensation was beginning to freak me out. Okay, hey, DC, why did I replace it with the sensation? Uh, so that we didn't think that pre-calculus was freaking her out. <laughs> Which is actually quite possible that maybe the author did intend to write that pre-calculus a... freaking her out, but... This is a sentence style I see a lot. Um, people try to, people have uh, two thoughts in in one um, clause and then they move on to the next one and they accidentally reference the latter. Yeah. Even though it's pretty obvious they mean the former because of the way their sentence is structured, it looks like they mean the latter. And that's like one of those super nitpicky things you could get into. Um, but if you can be specific, be specific. Yeah, and I think you don't want to ever, the worst thing that can happen to a reader is that all of a sudden they're confused by what you mean. Is yeah, literally yeah. the worst thing that can happen, um, which is why, uh, we can go into that later. I was going to talk <laughs> about my pronoun usage in my novel, but that's getting too uh, self promoting. It um, <laughs> was beginning to freak me out. Warren was sitting next to me like usual. Uh, he usually does. This is another example of word economy. Just say like mm -hmm. you. We've known each other uh, since kindergarten. These are just, this looks like just a basic typo that I've corrected. Yeah. Some would say we were friends. And now you'll notice earlier in the, in the um, edit, I deleted the word would and switched it to a different verb. But here the hypothetical makes sense because she's talking about people hypothesizing about them being friends. Then comma, and here's, we get to the word got, um, where 
they were making fun of me for disliking the word got. Um, so we have two options here. I've suggested the use of then he joined the football team while I took more honors classes. Meg, why would you maybe want to keep got here, though? If you if you're wanting to create a motif. Um, and use got as a theme and not maybe specifically as a verb in and of itself, then you could say, he he got on the football team. I got into honors classes. My best friend got pregnant. Um, <laughs> because then, then you have a theme. Then you have a, a linguistic theme that you're following. Yeah. But in order for it to be a motif, there, it has to happen three times. Um, and so here, I would highly suggest changing to more specific verbs. So there's a second reason why you might want to keep got, though, is that if you're trying to emphasize particular phrasing that a character uses, depending mm -hmm. on their dialect or something like that, uh, it may voice. be that they just, like, use the verb got all the time, which there are places yeah. there that are going to use certain <laughs> verbs more than others. And that's, like, a very particular research aspect that people need to do and in, go into to, like, learn dialects. It's one of the hardest things to do. I am not an expert in dialect, and you need, like, crazy good sensitivity readers to pull that off to get it accurate. Um, if you're going to try and go that deep into like nailing a character's voice based on where they're from, because you can get really offensive really fast if you try to do that. <laughs> you're not careful. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so he became popular. I didn't. Not that I care. High school is just an in-between place like this town. So we're at the end of this line edit. Lots of really interesting things going on. One of the important things about a line edit, as we said at the beginning, though, is that these are all... Almost all of these are suggestions. Some of these I would emphasize and really push more than others. <laughs> um, especially like a comical looking combination. I actually think is really good sounding phrasing as opposed to that made him look comical. Um, and also the Oxford commas, very important. But that's kind of more of a grammar edit that someone, a yeah. proofreader would be That'd checking. That'd be a proofread thing, for, yeah. Yeah, the Oxford commas. Um, Another reason too you might say just to use it is because... Um, a general rule of writing is that if you if you follow an optional rule at all, you have to follow it through your whole work. So yeah. if you choose to omit the Oxford comma and then you get to a point where you need it, you can't have it. So just use it. Yeah, it's a good point to bring up. So <laughs> uh, so we've talked about the, the very nitpicky words, but I also, I mean, Meg's going to be focusing on the developmental edit in the next video, but I think it is worth taking a moment to note some of the really good things that are happening in this story. Um, the one that stands out the most to me is there's a lot of really good sensory experiences throughout this. So, like, I noted right at the beginning that my hands burn and tingle. Great job getting a, with just five words, getting a reader to be like, oh, she's, like, panic freaking out about something. Yeah. You know what else I, I noticed that was really good is that we have these thoughts, um, we have these feelings, and then sort of a, a numb sensory experience where she's observing things happen around her but isn't really experiencing them. And then when she gets home, her energy leaves her body. Yes. Which, if you've ever had, like, really high anxiety or a panic attack, that's exactly what it's like. It's, a, it's an overload until you go numb and collapse. Uh, which I think is really, really well done here. And so I want to bring back, so like there's also, sh we've got the I'm still shaking, the strange heat remains inside my skin. So I want to bring up a point as to a reason why leaving the other options might be preferable. That if, you, if the author is actually trying to illustrate the idea that the character is going through almost like an out-of-body experience where they're not feeling it, they're kind of almost observing themselves feeling yeah. it. It's really hard to pull off. It's a very nuanced thing to do, and you've got to do it really well. But that is a thing to think about, that, like, if your character is in such, a, like, a state of mind where they're actually, like, perceiving themselves as opposed to experiencing, if at least that's the experience they're having, then going in the less active form, the shaking is still there. Um, that's why it's so... That makes sense. That's why it's so important to understand how all of these rules work not because you should always speak in an active voice because that's just how you write you have to understand what each of those rules does and how it affects your your audience yes and how it conveys your story because the more you understand that the 
the more specific you'll be able to be in nudging your readers a certain way. And something that we actually glossed over, but this is another example of this, is that um, so we have this of my eye, of my lids that I deleted, and she's just the author is describing behind the darkness of my lids, like the darkness of my eyelids. But a character seeing darkness, um, it's already established that she's closed her eyes. Yeah. So <clears throat> in seeing darkness, there's only one place that she can be seeing that darkness from, and these sorts of of my lids, where you're like honing in on very specific, like features of a character to describe add description can actually have the opposite effect that you might think it is which actually can pull a reader out of the character's experience because you're like focusing too much on things that the character wouldn't actually think about when you, you know another eyes, way you could change that would be instead of behind the darkness could be behind my lids i just yeah. wouldn't have both yes and but i like the use of darkness here personally i do i do yeah. too because it's thematic. Um, so another another example of like these this sort of thing is uh, is if you say my hand grabbed, you can just mm -hmm. say I grabbed, um, or I saw the boy fall. You can just say the boy fell. Because we, we talked about this on Writer's Row before. Yeah, exactly. And so like the, the, it's those little things. So do you guys see anything else that you really like about this piece though? Maybe a little bit more from the the narrative perspective. Well, I was just thinking, like you, like we called out the short, punchy sen sentences. Um, you know, it almost without thinking. I and talking about school, like I'm sort of like, yeah, somebody who's in, you know, maybe middle school or high school or something, they might not be able to comprehend. So their mind is working in these short, choppy sentences, and yet it still doesn't feel overdone in these 500 words. And so you're getting that effect. It's sort of becoming part of the theme and the rhythm in, in just a short period of time. So I thought that was really effective. Yeah. Uh, and one of the things that stands out to me too is that in these 500 words, the author does a really good job of pulling you into the character's experience. And I think part of that has to do with all the sensory physical experiences that are going on, um, but it's really good. And one of the things that we didn't mention is, um, because this is kind of more that developmental aspect, Meg, is there a flashback going on here? Oh, there is. Um, this is both technical and developmental. Um, because we start the story out, you'll notice, in the present tense. And the author does a really slick move mm -hmm. where they prime you for the past tense. They prime you to think, well, I wonder what happened before this present moment. And then slips you right into that moment and then uh, suddenly narrating the story in the past tense. Um, there's, no there's no italics, there's no flashbacks, there's no date changes. It's a very smooth transition into, so this is what happened. You might be wondering how I got, got here. And then it smoothly transitions back without any of the, the awkward shoehorning. It's very well done. Yeah, absolutely. So... so I think that's a good place to uh, to call this uh, episode, but uh, really great job. Um, I think, uh, you know, Serena has a really good start here, and anybody who's watching this might want to read more, so I think it's uh, it's good for her. It's, it's good for us to be able to dig into a story like this, and uh, really appreciate it. Any parting words before we wrap it up, uh, Meg and Chris? Well, you can follow Serena's by her Twitter and other contact info will be in the show notes below. Uh, so make sure you follow her if you're really intrigued by this story, because maybe one day it'll be a book published that you can read. I'm intrigued. It's interesting. Like it has a super strong hook. Yeah. Very good. Meg, you got anything? Um, pay attention to your, what your English teacher said, because maybe they knew something. Awesome. Yeah. And make really sure you tune in to watch the next episode because we're going to talk about some developmental stuff that is also super important. Yes, and I think, I hope this has emphasized how much of a conversation editing is. Uh, yeah. Both Meg and I have video chats with our clients to talk about um, the edits that we've done, uh, to make sure they have any questions, to make sure if they like question an edit we've done, that they can give feedback and ask and inquire. Like, have this sort of conversation with your editor 
and um, because it's going to be beneficial. Both people are going to learn from it. The editor is going to be able to work with the client better because they're going to understand how they think. It's always good to have a face to the person as well. And now an editor may not spend this long on two pages <laughs> with you because that's that's time and time equals money. But uh, hopefully it gives you an idea of the sort of conversations you might have. Yeah, really appreciate the depth. I think a lot of people are going to get things out of this. You know, writing community is going to enjoy it. So really appreciate you all coming on and we will catch everyone next time.